it's to me to to be in a town that is named for Tecumseh um, on the week of the 200th anniversary of the outbreak of the War of 1812 is uh, it, it gives me um, a feeling about um, the meaning of this man's life, which does speak to us exactly as you said and, and you suggested in both in the song and in that quote that you began with, because it's interesting, and I want to make this point at the outset. Tecumseh's life has been discovered and then forgotten quite a few times over the course of the last two centuries. He's somebody who comes to people's attention and then has tended to fade, and now he's come to people's attention again today. And I hope that this time um, there is going to be a permanent recognition that is going to be ongoing about Tecumseh's life and what it means it means to this country specifically, what it means also to North America, what it means to native peoples, and also what it is as a symbol of a man who fought for freedom all his life to the world. I mean, Tecumseh belongs to everyone, and that's something that's very important to realize. And Len made the point that uh, Tecumseh was not a Canadian. He didn't aspire to be a Canadian, and believe me, I am not pinning a maple leaf flag on him uh, tonight here because that would be false to his memory. Nonetheless, he is one of the founders of transcontinental Canada. The fact that there is a country here today has a great deal to do with him because he changed the course along with Isaac Brock. He changed the course of the history of North America in the summer of 1812, not very far from here. The battles that first began in that war it could easily have been a successful American invasion, and had it not been for Tecumseh and Brock um, in the summer of 1812, that's how it would have turned out. I want to talk, before I talk about the War of 1812, I want to talk about Tecumseh and his life and how he came to be the person that he was. He was, I mean, in some ways your life is shaped by where you were born and when you were born. These things are kind of stamp something on you and it's, it's kind of the fate that you have and that you are left with. He was born in 1768 in a Shawnee village near the Ohio River. And what that did is it placed him right in the line of fire. If you wanted to be in the line of fire, you get born in 1768 in the, on the Ohio River. Because what's going on is that white settlers are moving down the Ohio. That's the new west. That's the river, that's the highway to the west, and they're heading right through the territory of the Shawnee people and other peoples along that territory in what is now the state of Ohio. And so Tecumseh, as a, as a child, has the experience a number of times of watching the village in which he lives destroyed. That's how he begins his life. At the age of six, he sees his father who is preparing to go out to fight a larger force. This is just before the outbreak of the American Revolution. And he's getting ready to go out and fight against a force that he knows he can't defeat. There's, a, there's no way, but they're going to fight that battle. His father dies in that fight, so he's six years old. Later, he moves to a new town with his mother um, and with his brothers and sister. And at this new town, again, the, the people he calls the Big Knives are coming down the river again, and they're in this time he's watching from a bluff up above, um, and he is seeing the town destroyed. Once again, the town is destroyed. It happens to him another time. So over the course of his childhood, that's his experience. His experience is that the white settlers are driving people off the land who have been on that land for a very long time. That's how he, that's his formative period in terms of his consciousness. And as he grows up, Tecumseh comes to believe that there has to be a defense against this. He's not the first native warrior or native leader uh, to think this. You could look back at people like Pontiac and Joseph Brandt who also had the same 
vision of putting together an alliance with great effect uh, in their time. But Tecumseh during his time is, without a doubt, the greatest leader, the greatest native leader on the North American continent and who does put together a confederacy whose purpose is to stop the advance of white settlers onto native territory. So how does he get, how does he get to that? We know a lot about Tecumseh from people who have spoken about him, uh, who have written about him, have handed down oral traditions about him. One of our best sources about him is actually a white boy by the name of Stephen Riddell, who was captured. One of the things that the Shawnee did, very interesting, is that when they were fighting battles against the Kentuckians, uh, which they repeatedly were, um, they would sometimes, to make up for, the, for the, the killing of native warriors, they would capture young white uh, children and they would actually raise them as Shawnee and they would bring them back, raise them, and this kid, Stephen Riddell, was 12 years old when he was taken prisoner by the Shawnees, raised as a Shawnee warrior. His younger brother, Abraham, also is. So that in some of the battles the Shawnee later fought, you got these two young, young white men who are fighting as Shawnee warriors. Very interesting. And Stephen Riddell, who later goes back to American society, has left us a record of what Tecumseh was like as a young, uh, first of all, from the age of 12 on, when they were best of friends. And so we get a picture of him. Now, sometimes the picture gets a little exaggerated. I mean, you, you've got a guy here who is who is so enormous in terms of the role that he plays in Native society and even in North American societies more generally. But you get the picture of him, he's a great hunter. Stephen Riddell tells the story of, you know, he, Stephen Riddell goes out with a gun and shoots one buffalo and uh, supposedly Tecumseh shoots between 12 and 16. All right, now that sounds like a bit of an exaggeration. But nonetheless, what you get the picture, here is a fine young man who is learning his way, learning his way around uh, the territory and learning how to be a provider for his people. He is, we learn, very amiable um, in the kind of games and dances that take place among young people, but he also is very serious. Uh, the story we get from Stephen Riddell is that the young women are more interested in him than he is in them. He has kind of this serious purpose uh, in life, and that serious purpose uh, becomes more and more defined as a, a, a quest for justice. Let's go back to that quote. Why not sell a country? Why not sell a country, he says. Why not sell the ocean? Why not sell the air? Why not sell the earth? Uh, that's what he's saying. And, and that, sure, that speaks to the world that we live in in the 21st century. Those words that Tecumseh speaks are words that two centuries later have enormous relevance for us. So here he is, um, he's growing up, he um, becomes involved in warfare of the kind of most brutal up close kind on the Ohio River uh, when you have a group of native warriors who are stopping uh, who are stopping rafts that are going down the river, barges that are going down the river and sometimes they're taking uh, whites prisoners, sometimes they are uh, ransoming them, sometimes they're killing them and they're torturing them. Tecumseh watches this going on and he's horrified by torture. One of the interesting things about Tecumseh, and he comes to this very much himself, is that he is from a very early age absolutely opposed to torture. And he says, I'm going to work with you, you know, I'll work together with you, but if you insist on doing that, no. I'm not going to be a part of that. Tecumseh is very clear about that. And that becomes his watchword for the rest of his life. Um, and you find in scenes, right, for instance, in the Battle of Fort Meigs uh, in Ohio, when white prisoners had been taken and some native warriors were torturing them, uh, they sent out for Tecumseh. The British general who was on hand, General Proctor, couldn't stop what was going on. Tecumseh rushes back and he stops what is going on. And some of those people were later set free, these American prisoners, and they have written stories about this man who showed up in the heat of all this, 
not speaking the language of all the native warriors, and, but be able through his presence to, to, to say, all right, this we are not going to do. This is not part of what we are going to do and saved those people's lives and they remember him for doing that. Um, he is, as he grows up, under the leadership of an older brother who is his mentor and in battles with the big knives over a period of years, uh, Tecumseh becomes a kind of junior fighter and warrior himself under the leadership of his older brother. The first time, and it's interesting to think about this, the first time he goes on a battlefield where he's actually fighting against uh, white soldiers, um, he's terrified. He's 18 years old. And uh, so we're not talking about somebody here who's kind of, who's, who is some, you know, Rambo type figure who's kind of born to fight. We're talking about somebody who, and think about the warfare of the period. The warfare of the period is kind of European style warfare where you go out and you've got muskets and you kind of stand up, you know, 40, 50 meters apart from the people on the other side and you fire back and forth. This is pretty nasty stuff uh, that, that um, this kind of fighting that's going on in this historical period. To come see the first time that this happens, he turns and runs. He flees from the field. His brother is wounded, his brother survives this one, um, but Tecumseh vows as he's, as he's leaving this field of battle, this will never happen again. It never does happen again. But it shows yet he had to, not only is he learning a political philosophy, not only is he ha learning a vision of society, he's also learning how to be a warrior. Eventually, that older brother is also killed um, and Tecumseh begins to become a leader in his own right. He becomes, by the mid-1790s, uh, he becomes a chief um, uh, of a community and also uh, a military chief. And so Tecumseh is moving forward from there. Now, the great period in Tecumseh's life, and I, I see him, I, I position him historically in what I call the endless war. Because but what happens in 1812 is that two wars come together. There's the war of the Americans against the British. I'll say a few words about that. But the other war is what I call the endless war. This is the war that begins when white settlement first occurs on the North American continent back at the beginning of the 17th century. That war goes on all the time. That war never ends. There are little periods of peace. There are deals, there are treaties, but that war is ongoing. In other words, the, 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 the white settlement keeps pushing and it moves along a frontier westward. So that by the time you get to Tecumseh's life, you're talking about, um, you're talking about a, a line of settlement that runs from right here. Um, you are here in, uh, at, the, at Windsor and Tecumseh. You're right on the corner where American settlement was just across the border in Ohio. It's Ohio, down through Kentucky, Tennessee, and then down to Alabama, to what's called the Mississippi Territory, which is Alabama and Mississippi, right down to the Gulf of Mexico. You draw a line right down there. That's where they've gotten to by the time Tecumseh comes along. And so what he does, as he develops his consciousness about defending the right of native societies to exist, and to continue to have their way of life and not to be forced into the category of becoming second-hand American citizens driven onto small plots of land, which is what the white society wanted to do for them at best, but to maintain their ownership and control of their lands and their way of life. That's what he is, that's what, that's what he's fighting for as you get into the first decade of the 19th century. And there's a very great moment of collision, of showdown, between him and a top leader um, in the United States. And that man's name is William Henry Harrison. He is the governor of Indiana. He later is elected president of the United States. Um, he runs on a slogan of Tippecanoe and Tyler II, which means, of course, he's using the, his victory in the Battle of Tippecanoe in the fall of 1811 against Native people as his ticket to the White House as so many, incidentally, leaders in the United States did. Andrew Jackson was a genocidal murderer of native people of the 
people that they call the Creeks, the Muskegee people in Alabama and Mississippi, and he used that to ride to the, to the White House. So you've got William Henry Harrison, who is kind of young, politically well-connected man, uh, close to Jefferson and Madison, and he is, uh, and what does he specialize in? He specializes in making treaties with weak native leaders. That's his thing. And he has stolen hundreds of thousands of acres of square miles of land in the territory of Indiana and on west from there. That's his specialty. And what happens in, in 1810 is that Tecumseh, who is putting together a native confederacy by this time, who is beginning to get groups of people who have speak different languages and have often been enemies in the past to realize, just as in the quote, that the red man has to rise up and has to get together as a single people to be able to stop the theft of their land. He goes out to Vincennes, Indiana, which was then the capital of the territory, and he has a meeting with William Henry Harrison. They sit outside. William Henry Harrison has set up um, this uh, formal setting for the meeting at his, at his house. Tecumseh says, I want to sit outside under the trees. And they said, we'll bring some chairs. He says, I'm going to sit. Um, I am going to sit on the, my, the mother earth and on her bosom. And that is good enough for me. So he and the warriors have come with him. Do that. And then you have the showdown. Tecumseh stands up and he says to William Henry Harrison, these treaties that you have signed, that the 17 fires have signed, that's the United States, the 17 fires have signed with native peoples, they're not legitimate. You have to get rid of them. You have to give back this land. And if you don't do that, there is going to be war. He is very clear. He says, I'm not here to bargain with you to get gifts from you. I'm not interested in that. I am the leader of this group of people who have come together and they have given me the right to speak in their name and what they're saying to you, what I'm saying to you is, unless you roll back these treaties and this land is returned, you and I are going to be fighting. And you can give that message to your big leader back in his town, which of course at that time is uh, Madison back in Washington um, in the White House. And so. William Henry Harrison says what the Americans always said during this period, said um, that, he said, these are legitimate treaties. And then he goes on to say, if the great spirit had intended the native peoples to be one people, he would have given them all the same language. You're not one people. We are not going to recognize you as one people. So he's saying in a very clear way, we don't recognize you. The United States has ownership of this land. We're going to continue to have ownership of this land. Tecumseh has tried. He's done his, he has met the enemy, and he has, in that conversation with the enemy, determined that one option is off the board. That is a deal with the United States. And so what he thinks is, OK, there's another option on the board, and that is a deal with the British. I can't, I can't, I would have been perfectly happy to make a deal with the Americans. That's not on offer. Um, incidentally, William Henry Harrison uh, thought very highly of Tecumseh. He described him as one of those uncommon geniuses who come along from time to time and change the order of things. In other words, and he said, had he lived in any other time and place, he would have been a transformative figure in the world. He compares him to Pontiac, and he says, this everywhere I go, William Henry Harrison writing this, everywhere I go, I'm hearing about Tecumseh. He's here, he's there, he's traveling on the Mississippi, he's on the Great Lakes, he's traveling to the south, and he's putting together his alliance. And he says everywhere he goes, he gets a very favorable reception from people. Uh, so Tecumseh then goes, he, he real, he, he's not going to be able to make a deal with the United States. He goes to Fort Malden, which is the British fort on Lake Erie, about 15 feet from here. And he goes there and he says, and he brings with him warriors from a number of other tribes in addition to the Shawnee. And he says, we are going to set ourselves up here. We're forming this alliance with you. And I expect that before long, this battle is going to be joined. And then we hear, then he goes out on his mission to further organize 
uh, the Confederacy. And one of the great moments in that is when he goes to what, is called, what the Americans call the Creeks to their capital city, Tuckhatchee, in what is now Alabama, uh, in the south. And he goes there and he speaks to, he, he, uh, there are, are thousands and thousands of people in the village because the Muskegee people had an, uh, an annual meeting uh, of the people with representatives from all of, uh, from the villages. And so he's there waiting to speak. And by this time, he's very famous. And they think, we want to hear the Shawnee warrior, the great leader, speak. So people are waiting. There's also an American representative there in the town. And so what does Tecumseh do? He waits. He says, every night, they say, you're going to come and speak. And he says, no, it's, the sun has gone down a little too far tonight. I think I'll wait another day. And he keeps waiting until this guy leaves town. He doesn't want to talk to uh, the representative of the American government. And then he goes, and there's thousands of warriors who've gathered to hear him speak. And he gets up and he makes a speech where he talks about what white society has done to the native peoples. And he talks to them and says, when they came here, they were weak, they were feeble. We gave them the means to survive and to live. And now they have grown like a giant serpent and they are sucking everything out of us and they are killing our women and our children and taking our land. And we have to stand up and fight together for our country. That's how he describes it. In other words, he's saying we are a people and we have to fight and we have to stand up. He says we must brush the sleep of slavery from our eyes. That's what Tecumseh says. In other words, let's not be conned by this American society. We are going to fight. And then he talks about, and it's interesting, Tecumseh is a Shawnee, but there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what, who are his ancestors. And it's possible that he had Muskegee ancestors because he talks, in this speech, he talks about brethren of my mother. He talks that way. He's saying that, you know, you're my relatives. This is a homecoming. I'm talking to people uh, who were close to us uh, not so very long ago. And then he does. Now, this is one of the a dramatic, I love this moment that occurs. He then is, is challenged in this meeting by pe some people who say, thanks for the speech, but if you come to our town, you know, I'm going to kill you. This is other native leaders who don't want to get into a fight with the United States. And, he, and Tecumseh turns, and as he walks out, he says, when I get back to Detroit, I'm going to shake down every house at Tuckhatchee. That's what he says. And then he, he leaves. And on December the 16th, 1811, the greatest earthquake in the history of East, Eastern North America occurs on the Mississippi River. And every house in Tuckhatchee is shaken down. This was an earthquake that was felt here. It was felt in Toronto. It was felt in New York. A series of earthquakes takes place. Now, that is a fact. I'm not going to interpret how that came about. That's uh, certainly not uh, something that I would regard myself as capable of doing. But it certainly convinced a lot of people in the Muskegee, among the Muskegee people uh, who uh, later took up the fight that was the fight that they fought against Andrew Jackson in 1813, which is a war which is linked very much to the kind of um, but the kind of uh, struggle that Tecumseh was involved in. So that sets the stage. Now, the War of 1812 is a different battle. It grows out of what I would call the Great World War of the time. To understand this, now very often American and Canadian historians, when they're writing about this, they kind of write about it very close up and they, and they don't give us a lot of context. To understand the War of 1812, we have to understand that what's going on is a series of wars between Britain and France that goes right back to the French Revolution in 1793 and doesn't end until the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. So it's over this period of time. And the British and the French are fighting each other, and they're prepared to use whatever weapons are at hand to fight that battle. And so the United States becomes increasingly annoyed with the... the British and French because they're interfering with their shipping on the seas, with their commerce. They are trying to prevent uh, the Americans from trading with their enemy. A second reason that they're extremely annoyed with the Americans, which has to do with this, is what is called impressment. Uh, 
This was the practice of the Royal Navy during this period of stopping American ships on the seas to look for runaway sailors from the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy was not a fun place to be in the early 19th century. There were something like 140,000 sailors in the Royal Navy. And let me give you one statistic. A hundred, uh, over uh, the course of 10 years, just over 100,000 people died in the Royal Navy. 80,000 of them died from disease. And another large number died from accidents, fires, falling overboard. Only 6,000 were actually killed in battle. Not a good place to be, the Royal Navy. And how did they get people to be sailors in the Royal Navy? What they did is they sent lieutenants to towns in England with gangs of ruffians who went and rounded up young men who were not gentlemen or didn't have an obvious profession, and they hauled them off and stuck them on the ship and said, you're in the Royal Navy. And then they gave you a choice. They said, oh, by the way, if you want to uh, enlist, uh, if you want to volunteer now, uh, we'll give you a few extra shillings, okay? So that's who you got into the Royal Navy. You got to then volunteer. So you got, so the British are stopping these American ships taking off people they claim are actually British sailors, sometimes hanging them from the yard arm of the ship, sometimes flogging them. You know, that's just to let other people know that it's not a good idea to desert from the Royal Navy. But there's a third cause. If you read Madison's Declaration of, of, uh, Declaration of War against Britain, the one that he signed uh, early uh, 200 years ago this week, um, he had, and most of it talks about what's going on in the seas. But there's a third reason, and that's very interesting, has to do with what we're talking about tonight. The third reason has to do with what's going on with native peoples in the West. And what he says here in these brief comments in the Declaration is that he says the British are continuing to arm, and he uses this word, savages, on our Western frontier. The word savages is used in the Declaration of War of the United States against Britain in 1812. And what he's doing is saying the British are helping supply these people and that's got to come to an end. That's one of the reasons. In other words, the quest for land. Land was the mother's milk of American politics at this historical period. If you want to understand, even go back to the American Revolution, one of the basic causes of the American Revolution was the desire to get Western land from native peoples when the British government wasn't going along with that. They signed a royal proclamation of 1763 that said you can't have land west of the Appalachians. Now to guys like George Washington, who was the biggest landowner in the United States at the time, that was anathema. In other words, the I don't want to take away the gloriousness of the American Revolution. I've not set out to do that tonight, but I just want to tell you the quest for native land is front and center in the American Revolution and also in the declaration of war against Britain in 1812. And we know that, here's how we know that this is true. If you look at which states supported the declaration of war and which didn't, it's very interesting. The states that were supposedly, well, they were being hurt by what's going on on the seas, by and large didn't support the war. New England didn't want to go to war against Britain, and a lot of New York didn't want to go to war against Britain because they thought it would hurt their trade. In fact, there was a movement in New England to secede from the United States during the War of 1812 because they didn't like the war. I'll tell you who did like the war. Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. In other words, it's the interior. And why did they like the war? Because it was a war against native peoples for their land, and also maybe you get your hands on Canada. That wouldn't be too bad either. This piece of Canada that you, that you live in down here, this stretch of southern Ontario, pretty attractive land, and Americans, many Americans, people like Henry Clay of Kentucky, wouldn't have minded getting their hands on this piece of land. So that's why war breaks out. And at this point, you have the invasion of Upper Canada or Ontario. And that invasion, of course, takes place right here. Uh, it takes place when uh, the general, General William Hull, who is the uh, uh, general in charge of uh, Fort Detroit, leads American troops across the border in July of 1812. And when he crosses, I've got to say something about American generals at this point. 
And this could sound a bit ageist, but I got to tell you, I'm older than any of them were. So I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, but here was the problem they had. The problem was that the Americans had won one war. That was the American Revolution. And when you win a war, it's quite common for the government to come along for the next war and pick the same people to be generals in the next war, even though they're past it. And William Hull was a man of 59. That sounds pretty young to me, but he was a man of 59. Um, you had no, uh, others who were in their early 60s. They had nicknames like Granny with their troops, and they were mostly people who'd fought effectively in the, in the American Revolution, but they didn't want to fight much. William Hull wanted to sit in Detroit and eat food with members of his family. And another thing was a problem for him. He was terrified of Native warriors. He had this incredible fear that Native warriors are going to come and get him and the members of his family. That becomes very important in what happens in the weeks that follow. He leads the Americans across into right here. Um, and he's greeted by three or 400 Canadians who come to greet him. Uh, because don't forget, the population, the European population of Upper Canada, which was only 100,000 people at that time, was to a great extent made up of immigrants from the United States. The early ones had been real loyalists who were loyal to the British crown. But later ones just wanted land. And they saw, OK, these guys are here, and you know, this is fine. And uh, it looks like this is going to be the winning side. He then issues a proclamation. And I want to say this. I don't know how you feel about this, but Canadians, he said, Canada is the first country that has the honor of being invaded by the United States after it becomes an independent country. Okay, the list is long uh, now, but we're not, we were first. We were first. And so what does, what does General Hall do? He issues a proclamation. What does he say in the proclamation? He says in the proclamation, we offer you, now that you have the stars and stripes floating over your head, we offer you the bounties of civil, political, and religious liberty. Very nice. He goes on to say, but, there's a but. And the but says, if you fight side by side with natives, this could be, and this is his phrase, a war of extermination. And then he says, any white man found fighting side by side with an Indian will not be taken prisoner. Instant destruction will be his lot, OK? This is what he says. All right, so it's nice. It starts off good, and then <laughs> you get the kind, of, the kind of bad stuff comes in. And so at that point, uh, a few days later, Isaac Brock, who is the, what's interesting about Isaac Brock, who was born in Guernsey, and the, the British Army is his life. He spent the last 10 years in Canada building up the Canadian militia and the defenses against a possible American invasion. What happens is that Isaac Brock issues a counter-proclamation, and he says, don't be unnerved by this. Um, he says, the native peoples have as much right to this land as any other men, and they are going to be fighting in this cause as they have been. So he issues the counter-proclamation. Um, he goes out, Brock goes down Lake Erie, and arrives at Fort Malden, and the first thing he says is, I want to meet Tecumseh. And this is on August the 13th, 1812. And at this point, you have uh, the two men walk into this room. They look at each other. They size each other up. And they come to the conclusion that they can work together. Brock looks at Tecumseh. Um, and he says, we want to learn how to fight in these woods. And you're going to teach us how to do that. Tecumseh looks at Brock. Tecumseh was not very impressed by British military leadership. Uh, up until that point. Um, and he says to his people later on in English, he almost never spoke English, but he says, this is a man. He says, Brock is different from the other leaders. The other leaders said, Tecumseh, go fight Yankee. He says, Tecumseh, let's go together and fight Yankee. So this is different. And they conclude very quickly that they can work together, that they can fight a battle together. And they decide that they are going to go off and do something that is militarily very foolish, and that is to attack Fort Detroit. Even though Fort Detroit was a well-built fort, and even though the Americans had twice as many men as they had um, as, part of, as their combined totals. Um, and so, but, and the British officers, apart from Brock, are all opposed to this attack. 
But the next day, they go off and do the attack. You have the, the British regulars, the Canadian militia, and then the native warriors who cross the Detroit River. And then they use psychological warfare to scare Hull, who is not a difficult man to scare. Um, what they do is they first they get Tecumseh's warriors to go back and forth in front of the fort many times to convince him there are many more of them than there actually are. There are probably about 700. Um, he makes them, this makes them think that there are a couple of thousand native warriors. Then they get the Canadian militia to dress up in the uniforms of the British regulars because they know that the Americans are afraid of the British regulars. And so at this point, there's a certain amount of cannonading going on between the two sides over the course of a couple of days. Tecumseh and Brock go up onto a small hill on August the 16th to look down on Detroit to decide what their next move is. The door of the fort swings open. A man on horseback rides out carrying a white flag. This is the son of General Hull. He couldn't get anybody else to do it. His son rides out. The fort is surrendered. Okay, that is an extraordinarily important event in the War of 1812 because up until that point, the Americans, people like Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson had said, this is going to be a mere, mere matter of marching. No problem. We are going to conquer Canada. Madison thought that. People like Henry Clay thought that. And so what the, this victory at Fort Detroit did is to stop that thinking. It was a very important psychological moment in the war. It also convinced people in Upper Canada that maybe the Americans weren't going to win this war. That maybe, in fact, there was going to be a different outcome. And this begins to change the whole thing. And it's extremely important. That is the great moment that these two men share together. They celebrate very briefly after uh, their victory. Um, Brock bestows a brace of pistols on Tecumseh and takes a sash and puts it around Tecumseh's shoulders. Tecumseh takes a sash of his own and puts it around the waist of the general. The general later dies wearing that sash at Queenston Heights a couple of months later. That's it for, their, for the two of them working together. Brock agreed that the goal had to be in this alliance the reconquest of land that had been taken from native peoples. But of course we know the story. The story is that they both died in the war. Brock dies at Queenston Heights a couple of months later. Uh, Tecumseh dies at the Battle of Moravian Town on October the 5th, 1813. That's a date I think you in this region should keep very much in your minds because it's a date that deserves serious appreciation. That is the commemoration of the date of Tecumseh. Um, on August the, 15th, uh, the 5th, 1813. And there are people who are working to do some serious things around that, and I think that you and the work that you're doing here in this community lends you uh, very much to that. Okay, the war goes on. There are atrocities on both sides in this war, and the atrocities against Canadians during the course of the war did begin to convince Canadians that they didn't want American occupation. They didn't want to be part of the United States. One of the first atrocities takes place with the arrival of the Americans in Toronto in April of 1813. And the Americans, after capturing the town, burned down the government house, burned down uh, the, uh, the, the, the parliament, the governor's house, and steal books and, and uh, ransack people's houses, burning many of them, okay? That happens. One of the worst atrocities in the war from the American side took place in a town called Newark, which is now Niagara-on-the-Lake, in December of 1813, when, a, when the Americans retreating from the area decided with the permission of top leadership and incidentally with a company of Canadians who were fighting uh, for the Americans uh, at that point to burn down this town. And they did burn down the town and most of the houses in it, leaving women and, and children to freeze to death in snowbanks. It was one of the worst atrocities of the war. But I want to be clear, there were tr atrocities on both sides. The British then went across and killed people wantonly at Fort Niagara and did a great deal of destruction in Buffalo and Black Rock across the other side. The most famous atrocity, of course, which the Americans, we tend to forget the kinds of things that have been done to us. We're not very good at remembering our history. We're very foolish not to remember our history because people 
who don't remember their history don't know who they are and uh, don't know what to do when they get into difficulties. Uh, but in the summer of 1814, and you all know this, in the summer of 1814, the British did capture Washington, did burn down the Capitol, did burn down the White House, and did burn down government buildings in um, Georgetown as well. Okay, how does this all end? It ends this way. Peace is being negotiated between Britain and the United States in Ghent and what is now Belgium. They sign a peace treaty in December, on December the 24th, 1814. And what does it do? First, it, it, it says the border's gonna be exactly the same as it was at the beginning of the war. For Canada, that's extremely important news because what it means is that the Canada-US border is not gonna be changed. Now, there have been border disputes between Canada and the United States over the past 200 years, some of them serious. But nonetheless, the basis for the border is there. And that is extremely important for the creation later of a transcontinental Canada. But the other result of the treaty, and that's what we're talking about centrally here tonight, which has to do with Tecumseh and the recognition of him and what he stood for and what he meant, is that the British gave up the demand which was central to his life, which was the creation of a native state that would go from roughly the Ohio River out up to the Great Lakes and then into, it would have included states like Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, um, and uh, Indiana. In other words, big section of American territory, which would have been a native state. That's what he was ultimately fighting for. He wanted to create a sovereign native state. And of course, that goal dies in December of 1814 when the British signed this deal. So the British, in other words, they, they, the Native Alliance was extremely important to them. In battles like the battles fought here, later in the Battle of Queenston Heights, when the warriors from the Six Nations, the Mohawk, played a key role in that battle, when the warriors played a key bat a role in the battle to capture Michel and Mackinac up in the north in the first days of the war, Without the native warriors in this war, it could, things could have turned out very differently, especially in this part of Canada. In this part of Upper Canada, things could have turned out very differently. But the British walked away from what was Tecumseh's central goal. Now I'm gonna just summarize, make a couple of comments about Tecumseh and, and what I think we can learn from him, what he was doing when he was building his confederacy is he is saying, we have to unite, we have to get together, we have a common enemy, and we have to overcome the things that have held us apart and recognize the things that we have in common. We may have different histories, we may speak different languages, but we all have a common purpose. That's what he is saying, and that message is a powerful message to people like us today. It's a powerful message whether you're dealing with um, the possibility of job loss in communities, the destruction of industries, the destruction of trade unions. This is a powerful message. Tecumseh speaks to us across the divide of two centuries. Uh, he's done it before, he's doing it now, and I hope that this time that message is going to remain in place as part of the very foundation uh, of what this country is. Thanks very much.